Sri Lanka's civil war lasted nearly three decades. Although it ended in 2009, deep wounds are still open. President Gotabaya Rajapaksa was a top defense official when government forces crushed an insurgency against the government by the rebel group known as the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ilam, or LTTE. About 100,000 people were killed and another 40,000 Tamil civilians were reportedly killed in the final onslaught. Numerous atrocities and war crimes were committed. Twelve years on, many say justice has not been served. A UN report warns the failure of Sri Lanka to address past violations has significantly heightened the risk of human rights violations being repeated. And it accuses President Rajapaksa's government of proactively obstructing investigations and trials. Since last year, he's assigned at least 28 serving of former military and intelligence personnel to important government posts. One is Admiral Jayanath Kolombich, who is now Foreign Secretary. The UN report says this is a sign of an accelerated militarization of the government and reveals intensified surveillance and harassment of civil society organizations, human rights defenders and victims, and a shrinking space for independent media. Can Sri Lanka ever close the wounds left by years of conflict and human rights violations? And will justice ever be served? Sri Lanka's Foreign Secretary, Admiral Jayanath Kolombich, talks to Al Jazeera. Sri Lanka's Foreign Secretary, Admiral Jayanath Kolombich, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Admiral, you're a former army officer. You served as Navy chief from 2012 to 2014. And this is the first time that the job of a foreign secretary is given to someone who is not a career diplomat, which doesn't seem to sit well with human rights organizations and people in your own country. Many people do not find it normal. Well, uh, President never told me to take a tough position in any way. He really wanted me to translate his and the government's vision on the foreign policy into operation or into practice. And of course, as a patriotic citizen of this country, I have taken the responsibility upon my shoulder to defend my country. And I do it uh, with the wholehearted approach to defend my country uh, against unfair criticism, unfair accusation. And I'm not uh, an extraordinary person. I'm mm -hmm. just a, a foreign secretary. I don't have any powers other than uh, being a secretary. So I'm just uh, another secretary, that's all. You know, sometimes it's all about perceptions and the image of a country, and you, in your, your own position is more about defending the foreign policy of Sri Lanka. But then again, the president has taken some controversial decisions over the last few months, particularly placing more than 31 agencies under the Ministry of Defense. I mean. That's not what the international organization was looking forward to see. They were looking to s forward to see someone consolidating democratic gains. What they are seeing now is an expanded militarization of administration functions. Well, you know, in America, General Colin Powell, who was a military commander, was made the Secretary of State. So that's okay. Uh, and there are many countries uh, who are having retired military officers. A person, a retired military person, just because he served in the military, I think should not be prevented uh, from performing a job for his country. And this figure of 31 is totally wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, this includes 25 uh, military officers who were appointed as coordinating officers to prevent COVID in the country, right? So it's only uh, uh, less than five, uh, actually it's about three or four uh, uh, secretaries that the president has appointed, like the defense, uh, civil security, mm -hmm. uh, health, and uh, agriculture earlier, and the foreign relations, it's only five actually, right? Rest of the appointments are all pure 
ability to combat this COVID pandemic. And many countries, you see, now Sri Lanka, uh, in the beginning, uh, in the in the beginning of 2020, when the uh, pandemic broke out, of course, from that time, use military. But many developed countries use military when things got really bad. Right, so this 31 figure is inclusive of 24 uh, or 25 as military officers who are actually serving in those areas were given the task to coordinate the COVID response. I see your point. However, seen against the backdrop of the latest developments in your, in your own country, the democratic gains of 2015, the constitutional amendment, now there's a new constitutional amendment, and many are concerned that they are seeing what looks like the beginning of military totalitarianism under Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Well, I think it's a wrong assumption, wrong perception. On the contrary, uh, what we have seen as people living in this country uh, after 2019 is a very democratic regime. There is no repression, none whatsoever. And you see, this government is like six months old, the proper government. And of course, the president is like one year, three months old. During this period, there were many protests. Even a backing charge has not taken place in this country, mm -hmm. right? Even a backing charge. No water cannon, zero, right? So there is human rights here. There is law and order here. Of course, there's one thing I have to tell you. The president came to power with a clear mandate to ensure national security. Sri Lanka is a country which was devastated by a violent armed conflict for three decades. And the moment we got our national security priorities right, mm -hmm. we won the conflict. But thereafter, we forgot national security. Now, the latest commission report about the Easter bombing is out. The crux of the matter, the thrust in that whole report is the then government did not pay any attention to national security and therefore the religious fundamentalists or religious extremists were able to carry out their dastardly act targeting churches, Christian churches on Easter day, Easter Sunday and hotels and kill more than 253 people. And that is purely... We will talk about that, but you do understand at the same time that you cannot use this as an excuse to further expand clamp down on minorities and clamp down on human rights gain in your country. I'll give you an example. I've been listening to you, praising the work of your government, your president. However, your government took the decision of imposing the cremation of the bodies of Muslims victims of COVID-19. And then you reversed that decision because of international outcry. Muslims feel in your country, Mr. Foreign Secretary, isolated, mistreated, and stigmatized. Well, uh, I, I can only talk about the Muslim burial issue, but I'm so happy that it is behind us. Now the desert is out permitting the Muslim burial because it was touching the sentiments of a, a large segment of our population. But it was a process. It was based on health and science. The decisions were made. This is not science. No one has ever taken such a decision internationally when the uh, infection cases were climbing globally. And, you know, this is an ultimate act of disrespect for Muslims when you decide and when you tell them this is the way you should bury your own people, you should cremate them. Your health minister, Mr Foreign Secretary, you remember what she said, that the only way to prevent COVID-19 is to get that syrup that was manufactured by a shaman. Well, that's not science, Mr. Foreign Secretary. Well, I mean, I'm so sorry to say that I was pretty much uh, fully involved in the COVID responses, and I have not seen any stigmatizing by the government, any marginalization of any community by the government, none whatsoever. On the contrary, everyone was treated equal because this was a pandemic. And you said it is not science. Well, it is science. You look at the World Health Organization report, the first one. They said all COVID bodies should be cremated. Of course, later they change it, right? Because the evidence are evolving. This is a pandemic the world has not known. Mm -hmm. The world has not experienced. So how do we say it is not science? It is science. When there is a doubt, we have to carry out experiments and find the answer. We took time. Yes, I'm not denying that. 
we took little time to come to that conclusion but finally it is behind us we are so relieved that we don't uh, upset our muslim brothers anymore we are very happy about it you 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 spoke about the easter sunday attacks of 2019 which were condoned by everyone including muslims but the communal violence that followed shows that there is a problem in sri lanka and i'll give you an example let's listen to what your president was saying uh, this is a quote from one of his speeches. We have some legitimate fears that the Sinhala race, that our religion, that our national resources, that our heritage would be threatened with destruction by various local foreign forces and ideologies that support separatism, extremism and terrorism. For many, this was widely interpreted as a message targeting Muslim community in Sri Lanka. Well, I think it is wrong to say the Muslim community was targeted in Sri Lanka. And you mentioned about communal violence after the Easter bombing. It was very minor, isolated, few incidents. I mean, thankfully, the government at that time were, was able to bring the, the situation under control. And actually, it prevented an escalation of violence. And in that regard, the, the, his eminence, the cardinal, the Buddhist clergy, they all got, got together with the Muslim uh, the, the clergy mm -hmm. and they appealed to the people not to incite violence. And we are so relieved that it happened. And the, the words that you mentioned, it does not target a single community. But on the contrary, you have to re realize the Easter bombing was the single most devastating attack which has taken place in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Sri Lanka was a country for 30 long years were at the hand of terrorism, but not a single large scale incident like that happened. Mm -hmm. Right. So this was targeting Christians, targeting uh, foreigners, targeting innocent people who had absolutely nothing to do with the religion. Speaking of minorities, the president a former army officer is accused of stalling efforts to prosecute those who were responsible of committing atrocities during the uh, civil war. There were commitments made by the, your country back in 2010, 15, that this is going to go forward along with the United Nations Human Rights Council. We don't see any indication that this government is committed to bring to justice those people who made those crimes. Well, you see any criteria, it is how you look at it. And if you mentioned the period 2009 to 2015, three presidential commissions were appointed, Parnagama Commission, Udulamagama Commission, Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission. We were gearing for a domestic mechanism. 92% of land which was acquired by the army during the conflict were returned. About 6 million antipersonal mines were cleared. 295,000 people who were used as a human shield and, I mean, came to the, uh, the government side were resettled and their houses were reconstructed. 12,500 ex-LTTE combatants were rehabilitated and reintegrated to the society. So if anyone's saying... There was no domestic mechanism to understand or define solution. I don't agree. All right. There was 100% so, domestic mechanism. If you don't but, agree, how yeah. do you explain that your government earlier this year withdrew from the co-sponsored Human Rights Council resolution to investigate and prosecute those responsible for uh, the atrocities committed during the uh, civil war? Well, I have a simple answer. The government which co-sponsored the 30 slash 1, we call it in 2015, what you are referring to. I, I request you uh, to study as to what happened to that government. Yeah. None of those architects of that 30 slash 1 is in politics today. They are all wiped out by the people, right? That is why the 30 slash 1 in 2015 was considered as the greatest betrayal of the sovereignty of this country in the modern times. And this is why the international community does not really trust what you're doing. I'll give you an example. You've, you must have uh, heard the United Nations Human Rights Chief, uh, Michelle Bachelet, when she's, she was saying recently that your government is consistently breaking promises about the need to bring about those who committed atrocities in your own country. She, she, she simply does not trust your government. 
Well, she doesn't trust the government. She is not here. She never visited here. None of her rapporteurs visited here. These are all desktop, desktop reports and some uh, uh, shadow reporting going from somewhere. There are various lobbies who have lot of money, right? So this is not a bona fide, a genuine report. We reject this report completely. Now, I think, look at Sri Lanka. We are a small country, small population. We are more interested than any outside power to keep our country together, keep peace and stability in our country, keep the social harmony. harmony. We are more interested than anyone else. So we, it is our country, it is our people, it is our brothers. All right, I see your point. Now we're, let's move to regional uh, affairs here, um, particularly your relations with India. You have said in the past that India is going to be top priority as far as Sri Lanka's foreign policy is concerned. However, you've recently scrapped the poor deal known as the East Container Terminal with India. At the same time, you've granted some power energy uh, projects to China, particularly on many islands of the Jaffna Peninsula. What's going on here? You seem to be favoring one party against the other. It is not that at all. This is called people's power. We are a democratic country. And if the president had his powers as people accused, he was determined to give the East Container Terminal to India and mm -hmm. Japan simply because it was a memorandum of understanding agreed in 2019 mm -hmm. by the previous government involving three parties. So he didn't want to upset it. But trade unions in the court, the clergy and the intellectuals, they all got together and they launched a very vicious campaign saying that these container terminals should not be given to any country. So the president had to give in and his own cabinet ministers spoke against giving that to the that to india so this is a democratic country people's okay. power matters. However, people's let power me really matter. let me remind you that this is not the general sentiment in delhi you know what they believe they believe that you have been asking the trade unions to instigate the refusal to pave the way for this to go to other companies pure and simple you know why well, because yes. there is this feeling no. that you don't that in sri lanka people still blame india for paving the way for the rise of the tamil tigers well that argument is there right this uh, this is the beginning of the tamil militancy in the early 80s uh, india is accused of this but of course india i think made corrections and if India had a hand, I think they paid dearly for it. The Indian peacekeeping forces suffered their largest number of casualties, fighting their own groups that they trained in Sri Lanka, very unfortunately. And their former prime minister, Rajiv Gandhi, was killed in Indian soil. So let us not go uh, that way. Uh, I mean, that's happened a long time ago. But if that's that happened, has nothing to do with it. Can you also uh, tell us whether this has nothing to do with India insting, insisting on your government to uphold the 1987 uh, India-Sri Lanka agreement that says it's about time to start a devolution of the political system to protect the rights of minorities, particularly the Tamils. Well, I request anyone to study the 1987 Indo-Sri Lanka Peace Accord and the what is called the 13th Amendment to the Sri Lankan Constitution which paved the way to create a provincial council. When the provincial councils were created in 1987, they had two main objectives. Of course, I have to now say provincial councils were created, chief ministers were appointed, certain amount of devolution of power except police and land power was given to the provinces. But there were two main objectives of creating provincial council. Number one, to bring peace, to stop violence. Number two, to develop those war ravage area, neither achieved. Mm -hmm. Neither achieved to the provincial council. War dragged on till 2009, okay. right? And the development took place, yes, because of the government's effort, but not because of provincial council. So provincial councils are there. Devolution of power is there. That is the 13th Amendment. Now, how we move forward is a different story, right? We okay. need to understand, but I have to tell you, it has absolutely nothing to do with the East Continental Mill. Now we have given them a better deal. 
we have given them a well, much well, wider, I, I, much larger work. I, I have to say there's, there remains still sceptical. You are dealing, you're going to deal with two key allies in the region, two key powers in the region, India and China. When you look at the other side of the story, you're expanding your financial and economic relationship with China, strong alliance, which is paving the way for China to expand its presence, particularly on the three islands, Delft, Analativo and Nainativo. The Indians are also very concerned about this. You see, I have lived in these islands, right? I'm not a stranger to this island. Now, this was an Asian Development Bank project. There was a tender process. Uh, I mean, it is wrong to say that we have given anything to China or it is it's wrong to say that we are giving something to India. These are private entities competing in an uh, international tender, right? So similarly, actually, this is the problem. When you say we want to give, we wanted to give East Container Terminal to India and Japan, that sends a wrong message. It was not so. It was not really so. It was mm -hmm. going to be given to a private entity. Right. So similarly, these two islands or the three islands, in fact, you mentioned, I know the people are crying for power. I know the governor of the northern province is saying, please do something, get these projects going. People need power, uninterrupted power. We need this combined solar wind uh, power for All our right. people. So this was a long process. It was an Asian development bank process. Mr. Foreign Secretary, the U.S., when they are when they refer to your relationship with China, they see it as a typical example of debt trap. The Chinese come to your country, give you loads of money, you're trapped to the point where you just have to surrender uh, some of your own assets back to the Chinese, like what happened with the Hampantutuk port. Well, you know, as of la end of last year, uh, end of uh, 2020, Sri Lanka's total external foreign debt uh, remained at 57 billion US dollars. Mm -hmm. Out of 57 billion US dollars, to China, we had only 9 billion dollars. And that is roughly, uh, I mean, about 10% of our external debt was to China. So anyone saying China has trapped us by giving debt, you can look at the figures. That's what I'm saying. Hambantota port was not part of that it was kind of a miscalculated decision made by the government to give it on a 99-year lease for a Chinese uh, conglomerate. Uh, we did not have to do it. Uh, it is not, uh, I mean, we did not have to do it. But it was not a debt trap at all. These are all uh, stories created by someone. Your, your task is, in a way or another, to win the hearts and minds of people all over the world about Sri Lanka, its potential and its future. However, there are two things here. The constitutional amendment of 2015, which was paving the way for a brighter democracy in your country, checks and balance. Now you have the 20th amendment, which expands the role of the president and the executive at the expense of the judiciary and the legislative. Don't you see that as a problem? You see, the 20th Amendment is a purely an internal domestic matter of a self-respecting sovereign nation. When the 20th Amendment was brought in, there were 32 cases which went to the Supreme Court. And they gave the directive saying, OK, certain clauses in the uh, proposed constitutional amendment were not in line with the Constitution. You had to remove that. And that was given to the parliament then, then the Supreme Court said two-thirds of majority in the parliament is required to pass to the 20th Amendment. This is a democratic country, and the parliament is appointed by the people by the democratic vote, which was certified by the European Mission as free and fair. So they, two-thirds majority, decided the 20th Amendment is okay. So 20th Amendment has not given undue power to the president. It has not diluted the power of the judiciary. It has not diluted the power of the independence in institution. As a diplomat, what do you think will be the top challenge facing in your country in, in the future? Is it going to be economic or security? Well, you see, we are going through a very difficult time to the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 pandemic has slowed down the world economy. 
and it really impacts very harshly on a smaller economy like Sri Lanka. So we have a huge task to overcome economic the situation in the country. Of course, we still have to combat the COVID pandemic. We have to give the, the injection to everyone. Still, we get about 200, 300 cases per day. So we need to battle that and we need to revive our economy. To do that, we need foreign direct investment. We don't want loans. We don't want grants. Of course, if someone is giving a grant, that's okay. But what we need is foreign direct investment. And for that, we need India. We need China. We need America. We need Japan. We need ASEAN. We need South Korea. We need European Union to come and invest. Give us choices. If you don't give us choices, later don't blame it's only one country we have gone to. Deep countries need choices. We need to overcome poverty. We are a middle, uh, a lower middle income country. How long should we stay a lower middle income country? We need foreign direct investment. We need to revive our economy. That's our priority one. So our foreign policy is directed towards the economic revival. Admiral Jayanath Kolombic, thank you. Thank you very much.